welcome back to the nonprofit show. You know, I like to say back because my assumption is that you've all found your way here before. I'm thrilled to have with me today as we round out this year, 2023. You know, we are finishing it with a bang. I've got some amazing rock stars that I get the chance to talk to. So today we have Bobby D, Bobby Ellert joining us. He is benefit auctioneer specialist at Call to Auction. Going once, going twice, talking to us about the trends in nonprofit auctions. So excited to have you with us. Julia is taking a much needed and deserved rest. So enjoy the rest of your year, Julia. Thanks for letting me, I'm Jarrett Ransom, be here each day uh, to join our guest as we wrap up this year. Again, want to say thank you to our amazing sponsors that keep growing and giving and so grateful to have them here. Thank you to our friends over at Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraising Academy at National University, 180 Management Group, your part-time controller, Staffing Boutique, JMT Consulting, Nonprofit Nerd, as well as Nonprofit Tech Talk. Please check out these companies. I like to remind all of you that their mission is your mission and they're here to help you do more good. So they've also helped us to produce nearly 1000 episodes. And I think our guest today, Bobby, you were with us in probably one of the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So you can find all of these episodes on streaming broadcast podcast, and you can, of course, download that app. So yes, you are not new to us. And in fact, you and I, and probably Julia, go decades back because Mm -hmm. we get to experience our amazing community together. But Bobby, tell us a little bit about yourself and what is a benefit auctioneer? What are you doing? I mean, you are up to a lot of big things that call to auction. Tell us a little bit. Yeah, well, uh, Jared, thank you so much for having me on. Julia, we miss you. I wish you were here that we could uh, give you the biggest hug in the world. But uh, yeah, we want to say Happy New Year to all of our nonprofit friends that are out there. And what a year it's been, 2023. It's been uh, great to be in the fundraising realm, especially the fundraising event realm. Uh, And that's kind of the space that that I find myself in, helping nonprofits across the country have great galas and events and golf tournaments and whatever event that they have to raise more money and raise more awareness and, you know, really uh, help those donors fall in love with the uh, the organizations that they have. So it's uh, it's fun to be in that uh, benefit auction or event strategist role to help design these events and help to create these events. And then as the MC auctioneer fundraiser live in person, uh, you know, is, is is a great honor to be that too and uh, get to be a life of the party, which is uh, which is a fun, 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 fun place. And I also have a great team that works with me at Call to Auction and uh, we can pretty much serve any nonprofit with any size budget anywhere in the nation now. It's uh, it's pretty neat. That is so neat. And I really love the benefit side of it because I remember when you and I met, you know, many, many moons ago many and it moons. really was, well, what is a benefit auctioneer and how are they different from an auctioneer um, right. in general? Would you be willing briefly, because I know we've got some key talking points to yep. share with our audience why it's so important to work with a benefit auctioneer? Right. Well, there's three types of auctioneers. The first type is the free auctioneer. We're not going to talk about them because you shouldn't be using them if you're raising money. Um, Then you have the second type of auctioneer, which is like a commercial auctioneer, someone that is selling assets, uh, real estate. I mean, the finest property in the world is sold by auction. I mean, you've got automobiles and art and real estate and airplanes and so much more is sold in, you know, it's, it's transactional is really what it is. It's, it's, it's a commercial business to business, business to end user space in that. And then you have a benefit auctioneer uh, or a fundraising auctioneer specialist, which focuses on nonprofit events. Um, Now, there are some auctioneers that can kind of flip flop. They can do um, both. That was the world I was in for 20 years. I was an auto auctioneer, um, actually a world champion auto auctioneer. And that's why I was making my living. And then one day uh, the light switch went off and I was like, wait a minute, there's bigger things at play and that that I can use my superpowers for. And I want to make an impact in the world. And I I found the nonprofit auctioneer space and uh, dove in with both feet. And I'm like, this is it. This is where I need to be. And I know that you've, you, you took a similar jump uh, one day and said, I'm going full, you know, this, you know, to help all the nonprofits out there. And it's, uh, it's been great to be in that space because 
again, the difference between a commercial auctioneer and a fundraising auctioneer, fundraising auctioneers understand um, the process of a fundraising event. They're not just up there to get, you know, talk fast. Uh, they're there to help uh, cultivate and identify those relationships with the, with those donors that are there. They're obviously they're there to raise as much money as possible, but ultimately it's really to create the best experience as possible. And sometimes you have the other two types, the free auctioneer or the commercial auctioneer, and they get up there and they get going real fast. They go 25, 35, 35, 45, 45, 45 sold it, $45,000. Somebody's like, well, what just happened? And a lot of times they're like scared. Whereas a benefit auctioneer is a bit more like, you know, I'm bid 25,000. I'm going to give $30,000 for this great cause. Let's go 35, 40, 50, sold 50,000. You know, a bit more of a, an entertainer or some of our friends call it auctiontainment. Uh, but uh, it's it's more of a impromptu performance that's there that's interacting with the audience that that that's raising their paddles that want to be generous, that want to have a good time and to build that energy and electricity in the room. So there's kind of your difference. Well, thank you for that, because I always love seeing you do your work. I've got to see, you know, several other of our colleagues is always yeah. inspiring. Yep. So let's talk about, I want to say this elephant has been in the room for quite some time, COVID, right? How yeah. has COVID, the pandemic, <laughs> yeah, how has this changed our nonprofit auctions? What are these changes that you're seeing? Are they staying? Are they permanent? Are they leaving? I mean, what, what are you seeing right now in this space? Well, there's definitely a trend going on in the donor space. Now, donors are becoming, uh, with everything, they're becoming more uh, strategic and more selective with the dollars that they're spending. They're being more selective in you know, the investments that they're making and the automobiles that they're buying and the homes that they're buying. Whereas pre-pandemic, it was a bit more like, yeah, let's just do everything and go to all the events and everything. And now they're being more selective with their time. They're very much more selective with their uh, their attention. Uh, also, their, uh, you know, what, what nonprofits really speak true to them, whereas uh Pre-pandemic, some people would be like, okay, let's go to 20 nonprofit galas and we're going to go and we're going to give them all, you know, 500 or $1,000. And now there's donors that are like, you know what, we're only going to go to five galas this year, but we're going to give bigger at these at these galas because we trust this organization for, you know, for us to invest our dollars in. We trust and we know that they're going to be doing good things with that money. So they're, uh, again, being more specific and more selective to the nonprofits they're choosing to partner with. But then they're also being very selective and choosy about which events they're attending. Now, if they went to an, an event pre-COVID, they're probably going to come back, give it one shot. But if it hasn't been good in the last three years, they're probably not going back because there are way better events that are out there. The donors are raising their expectations. Um, they're raising their hopes. They're raising their dreams. They want to have a great time. They want to feel really, really inspired. They want to feel really good and have that that lump in their throat and that you know that that warmth in their heart when they're leaving. And if nonprofits aren't delivering that and are not providing that, um, that individual, that donor is not coming back next year. But for the ones that are really knocking it out of the park and creating a great program, creating a great storytelling opportunity, and then also a great fundraising opportunity that's smooth, that's fast, that's fun, that's energetic and inspiring, those donors are going to come back and they're going to invest more and more in the future. So that's the biggest change that I've seen. You know, that's really interesting, Bobby. And I, I have not only witnessed it for myself, but, you know, really seen that in our community um, as well, where I feel like there's fewer galas, galas, tomatoes, tomatoes, right? Like, like taking place and being, mm -hmm. you know, like we're being a little bit more intentional about what events we are creating. Yeah. What is that online space? I'm curious, right? And, and I, I see the galas are still being produced in this hybrid situation, yep. but what about the auction side of that? Is that successful to have that hybrid? Well, it depends on the organization. Um, and I hate to use the D word depends because every organization is uh, situation is completely different. Um, but there are national organizations that are trying to bring in individuals from multiple states or even multiple countries. Um, and in that in that space, they're uh, seeing a lot of success with the virtual sure. or hybrid style of events. Uh, and then there's those that are very localized in, you know, specific, you know, like locales like Phoenix that you have to have an in-person event. And sometimes they will stream it live stream you know out into the world um with all the now mobile bidding or mobile giving technologies that are out there um they do have an opportunity for people that aren't at the gala to make bids or make gifts and whatnot so the technology is there uh, 
But the donors, do they want to interact with that? I mean, I think what's happened now post-COVID is that everybody has been Zoomed out like crazy. And they're like, okay, if I don't have to go on a Zoom meeting on my off time, because I'm on it all the time at work now, that um, I really want to go and I want to see people. I want to feel people. I want to be in that that electric energy space that is a gala. Um, and that that's, that's what we're seeing craving. And there's so many... Again, events, like you say, the ones that were just okay or mediocre definitely are going away, but there are some galas that continue to grow by leaps and bounds because they see that focus. They're like, okay, this is where we're going and this is this is what the donors want. We're going to give them right. exactly that. Well, and that innovation. And I think we're seeing some innovation on those items that are being you know, offered. So what are yeah. the donors interested in? What are you seeing some bidding, you know, popularity bidding happening? Well, what donors are really wanting and what we're seeing in this marketplace or industry um, is these unique experiences. Now, the best selling auction items that I've seen are in, like locally sourced uh, chefs, restaurants, uh, sommeliers, vintners, um, anybody that's in that like high class food and wine, uh, you know, kind of that gourmet meal stuff uh, that a organization has a partnership with someone like that. And they can create that experience where a bidder, an auction winner uh, gets to bring, you know, eight, 10, 12, 15 of their friends. And then they have this thing, you know, whether it's, you know, whether they're, you know, barbecuing steaks under the, you know, under the stars, you know, out in the desert, or if they're having a uh, hot air balloon brunch, you know, the hot air balloon brings them into this beautiful brunch space, or they're doing a, a wine bourbon tasting with this gourmet food from this, you know, uh, food network chef or something like that. Like that's um, going, you know, like people love that. They're like, okay, those are selling like hotcakes. And then uh, exclusive travel opportunities where, uh, Someone couldn't just book the thing on the internet is, is really what it is. Now, maybe uh, the organization knows someone uh, that has like a ski condo in Park City. Maybe we know somebody like that. Uh, or they have a place in Napa or they have a special access to something in Southern California. And, and there's maybe a meet and greet that goes on with a celebrity um, or an entrepreneur or something like that. Um, like here in New York City, we love to have these uh, lunch dates with uh, different uh, celebrities or, you know, kind of high powered business people. Uh, those always sell really well, but it's uh, what I call in obtainium. And if uh, people can have an opportunity to buy something they can't buy anywhere else, that's a great auction item. Yeah. You know, it's so interesting. And I, and I do think it comes back to knowing your audience. I was at an event probably in October, so not that long ago, still Q4. Goat yoga was a hit, Bobby. Like, and not to say that that was a very expensive item, but no. the popularity of the bidding for that experience, because it yeah. was a private opportunity, um, that as well as some sound healing bowls, yeah. like this person would come into your home and you could, you could create this experience for yourself. And like, I think it was like six other girlfriends or oh, cool. you know, whoever. So these experiences that you're talking about, yeah. and I love that you're saying like really that locally source. So what's yeah. happening in your community that maybe the general public yeah. don't have access to? Yeah. And, and, and it's, looking within your your donorship looking within your leadership you know who knows who knows who that can identify these unique opportunities and it could be something as simple as like goat yoga um we're seeing botox parties like crazy champagne and botox yeah, yeah bubbles and botox i don't know but it's like like i mean it works in some sectors it works in scottsdale really well um now in portland oregon maybe not so much but uh, but it's you know again looking at the clientele or the donors that you have um what types of things could you create that are outside of the box that some people really don't even you know had ever really thought about and then when they get to the gala they're like oh that's so cool we have to do that and if it's a multi-person opportunity like you know two three five couples all come together and they pool their money well then what ends up happening is that auction price is that much more bigger. And then you have that many more donors um, that are a part of that. And a lot of times people that are at those tables, you'll have a host and then they'll bring, you know, four other couples. And then they look around the table and they're like, Hey, should we go in on this? Let's yeah. do it. All right. And then they all bid on it and everybody's happy. Yeah. And to see that energy is always fantastic. You know, I, I'm curious, 
Do you recommend that organizations survey their donors, their previous attendees? Like, how do we really capture? Because I have to witness to you, Bobby, early in my career, right? I was thinking, no one's going to bid on this. This is so expensive. And then I realized that I was essentially shopping with my budget, which yeah. was not the budget of the attendees, right? Yeah. So that That was a big mindset shift for me. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about how do we essentially secure and procure, you know, items with our attendees in mind, not necessarily the committee or the staff that's planning right. these events? Well, the key component to that is bringing leadership into that conversation. Uh, there's a, a service that I provide to my clients is uh, I call it the dream game. And it's usually during a board meeting, board committee meeting, however it is. And we throw it out there. It's like, friends, where would you want to go? And someone's like, oh, I want to go to Maui. Someone's like, oh, I want to go to Napa. Someone's like, I want to go to New Zealand. Someone's, And they throw out all these different ideas. So like, I want to have dinner with so-and-so and so-and-so. And then and then we go around the room again. It's like, does anybody know anybody on this list? And a lot of times there'll be people that raise their hands. They'd be like, you know what? My my sister's husband is a famous chef from food network and he lives in California and we could totally get a house there and yada, yada. And all of a sudden now it's like, Whoa, this is something that they would have never thought that they could get because they didn't know who they didn't know. Um, and then on the other side of that is then I, we go around the room and say, is this something that you would be interested in? And if the, and the answer is like crickets, like then, okay, that doesn't belong in the auction. But if everybody's like, Oh, that's a great, I would totally give money for that. Then that's your, that's your win. Um, and then another piece of advice I give is especially for those that are, are in uh, the paid admin positions or staff positions and they're in charge of uh, the, the organizing of the items in the event um, is not to judge your donors wallets uh, again, because, you know, we have different uh, financial biases and kind of experiences with money and whatnot. And a lot of times that gets brought into the conversation like, oh, they would never buy that for $10,000. And all of a sudden now you put that item in there and it sells for $25,000. Um, just Two because, of them, right? Like yeah, they sell it twice. Yeah. And you're like, wow, I had no idea that, you know, our donors had this much money and yeah. you don't know until you ask. And I think that's coming up to our next question. It absolutely is. And I was just queuing that up. So, you know, really looking at this from the impact of the mm -hmm. paddle raises oh, yeah. um, and current strategies and curious what you're seeing of this. You know, I know that, that you have a great footing in this space across yes. the nation, as you shared earlier. Yes. So one thing I've noticed too, and I don't really want to take us off course, Bobby, um, for the four years we've been doing the nonprofit show geography matters, right? Like really mm -hmm. knowing where is your event? Who yep. are the attendees? So what are you seeing? And I'm curious if you could speak, you know, across the nation, of course, the yeah. impact on these paddle raises and the current right. strategies, what are you seeing in this, in this space? Well, just like everything, it always starts in New York city and then it, you know, radiates out from yeah. there. And what we're seeing here in New York City is that the, again, the attention span and the time investment that donors have is very, very small. Um, and we're seeing a lot of Monday night, Tuesday night, Wednesday night events where in the city they will have, a, you know, a big gala or it'll be a, like a cocktail party. It'll be heavy hors d'oeuvres and it'll be more of a kind of networking mix and mingle time. And they'll have a very short program. Hey, this is who, what we are. This is who we are. You know, this is what we do. Uh, this is the story that we're telling. They sell, tell the story. Um, they build up to what we call the golden goosebump moment. We make the ask, all right, who's in 10,000, 5,000, 2,500 in, 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 in creating that opportunity for everybody to give in an effective and efficient manner. And then as soon as that's done, oh, thank you so much. We've raised $2.3 million. Enjoy the rest of your night. And the program can be 15 to 25 minutes. It's a much more compacted thing. And I'm starting to see this more and more uh, paddle raise only events uh, moving across the nation. And like when I pull my colleagues that are you know, fundraising auctioneers, they're starting to see that they're doing more uh, paddle raise or philanthropic oriented events versus events that are more transactional with the silent auctions and the live auctions and the raffles and the, all the things uh, where they're now really looking more into storytelling and that true event philanthropy. So it's, so it's definitely switching um, towards there. Now um, uh, this is a, a, a place where I really dove in uh, with my partner, my wife, Aaron, and we came together uh, five years ago and we created a brand called Inspire Hearts Fundraising. And we're the only uh, fundraising event firm in the nation that focuses on paddle raise only events. 
So we're starting to uh, have that conversation with a lot of different organizations that are looking to change it up a bit, or they're looking to create more efficiencies, or they really, you know, have got kind of distracted from what the whole point of having the gala is. And they're like, all right, let's bring it back. Let's bring this focus back. This is why we're here. We're here to raise money. We're here to identify more donors. And we're here to make sure everybody feels good when they leave. And and we want to bring everybody in. And that's that inclusivity is really, really a big component of that. Yeah. I, you know, I love that you mentioned and that you've seen it too. It kind of starts in New York and then it radiates from there. Yeah. We've certainly seen that here for the show. Uh, you know, our, our guest staffing boutique, they are right there in New York as well. They've brought a lot of the trends early on your part-time controller. Similarly, yep. I'm really curious about this paddle raise um, and having more of them throughout the year. My curveball question. Yeah. I know you're ready for Bobby. Are you seeing this more in that gala type setting or are you seeing it in a more intimate, you know, be it a, a private space in a restaurant or even mm -hmm. a personal residence? Are you seeing yeah. it happening in those situations as well? Yeah, all across the board. Like we've done paddle raises with 10 people. We've done yeah. paddle raises with 10,000 people. And it's any time that there is a gathering you know, of, of individuals that are coming together to try, you know, they want to do something amazing as a group, as a community. And now the nonprofit, like they're spending all this time and energy to gather this group there. It's like, why not maximize the time that you're there? Many times, especially different private school or church organizations, they're like, you know, our donors don't want to be public in giving. They don't want to raise their paddles. It's like, well, most of them do. And there's a few that don't. And that's OK. We have strategies that we can include them within this paddle raise and this within this uh, special appeal, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but yes, any event that has a gathering of individuals that really care about the cause and have a capacity to give make the ask. I mean, it, it, it doesn't, I mean, you don't, what is the, what is the thing? It's like, you get 0% of the hundred of things you don't ask for. So you got to ask and you can ask big. And if you have someone that's an expert in the ask, they can help you set you up for success. Yeah. I think you're, you're trying to, to paraphrase a Michael Jordan quote, right? Like something like that. Yeah. hundred <laughs> percent of the shots you don't that's take. It. Thank you. It's uh yeah, here we are mid Christmas and Ooh, my brain's not working. Well, show us that mug because I just think that's adorable. I, I know there's, the listeners can't see it, but is that a gnome? An elf? Yeah, there's there's no place like gnome for the holidays. Oh, perfect. That yeah, is we we have about three hundred gnomes in our house, and Aaron loves gnomes, and they're everywhere. They're everywhere. That is so <laughs> great. So, Bobby, I'm going to put you on the spot here, but we always like to ask the crystal ball questions, especially as we're so close to ending this calendar year, flipping the mm -hmm. calendar to next year. What are you predicting, you know, shine up that crystal ball. I know you and Aaron have a few there in the home, yeah. but what are you seeing for next year? You've already shared so many great, you know, trends and best practices and kind of what's, you know, what's shining through. What is your big prediction for next year? Well, what we're already seeing is more highly produced events and highly you know, produced storytelling opportunities uh, where uh, the, uh, event organizers, uh, the fundraising strategi strategists, as well as the production teams are really teaming up uh, to design an experience that you really can't have anywhere else. And uh, it's always about creating what I call that golden goosebump moment. And it's using light, it's using sound, it's using scripting, it's using uh, different positioning in the room, it's using all of these different production elements. I mean, literally taking a cue right from Broadway and, and making that program more engaging, make it more interesting, uh, and then making it just that more inspiring. And when in donors are more inspired than they are, uh, you know, they're, they're more inclined to give. And then you have to have that motivator that's there to help them to take action. And then instead of the donors and the guests that are in the room, just being a uh, passive observers, they're actually active participants within that experience that's happening. And the more participation that's going to happen in the room, the more fundraising that you're going to have. So it's really uh, crafting and designing uh, these, these fundraising experiences to be like very, very impactful, not only on the donors, but then for the nonprofits themselves. That's in my crystal ball. I love it. And it gave me that, that golden goosebump moment because I could see the production and yeah, and maybe you've been to a similar event. I'm thinking of one here in our community where they had multiple stages and it was yeah. more or less, I'm going to throw out the Benavon model breakfast, yep, right? Yep. But multiple stages, a lot of people, production. I too, I love going to an event. Now I will say I'm an extrovert. So this might be different for different personalities. I love the experience of 
you know, these opportunities. And, you know, no shocker, Bobby, because if people are bidding on experiences, why wouldn't we want to infuse our event into one big experience in production? That's it. The experience ties to the brand of the nonprofit. And and it's a positive experience that's going to live for a long, long, long time. Um, right. A negative experience will live that much longer. So just make it good. It's like my, it good. my, yeah, my whole purpose in life now is to help organizations have better events because like the days of the like boring, sucky event, that's gone. It's like, now nah, we're going to make them great. We're going to make them amazing. <laughs> and, and people are going to leave and they're like, we love that organization. I can't wait to come back next year with my rich friends. That's right. And just so you know, that yawn was for the event, not for you, of course. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, those are so <laughs> over snooze Ooh, fest. I think well, the Bobby, kids are calling it cringe. Cringe, total cringe. Well, <laughs> Bobby, you have definitely brought some insightful wisdom with us today, as always. So, Bobby D. Ellert, thank you for joining us. For those well, of you watching, you having me. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You've just heard from Bobby, benefit auctioneer at Call to Auction. Check him out, call to auction.com, up to some big stuff. So, uh, Julia, I hope you're enjoying some time off. Uh, maybe you're planning some experiences already for 2024. And I'm Jarrett Ransom. Always fun to be here. I want to say thank you to our amazing sponsors that have been with us all year, moving into next year. So, shout out of gratitude to our besties over at Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy nonprofit thought leader, fundraising academy at National University, 180 Management Group, your part-time controller, staffing boutique, JMT Consulting, nonprofit nerd, as well as nonprofit tech talk. You know, many of these companies truly have been with us from the very, very beginning, as have you, Bobby. So again, thank you, gratitude. Um, and I know that I'm going to be scheduled on your podcast. So you tell people where we can find your podcast, because that's interesting too. Absolutely. Everywhere you can find podcasts, it's called Heart of the Gala podcast, uh, sponsored by our firm, Inspire Hearts Fundraising. And we really talk about all things gala. And it's people that are in the gala space, but then we're also bringing in experts from outside of the gala space because the gala is really one night of 365 days of fundraising. And if we can leverage the event and make it awesome, then it's all of those other opportunities for revenue is, is huge. And you know, having someone like yourself with so much experience and knowledge and be able to leverage those different elements there to make the event better and to set it up for a bigger success success before, during, and beyond. That's what we're all about. So I'm obviously passionate about helping events be better. Absolutely. I'm ready for those in 2024. Well, Bobby, right. again, thank you. I know you've got some family commitments, so enjoy yeah. your time with your family. For all of you that have joined us today, as we end every episode, we want to remind you to stay well so you can do well. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Thanks, Bobby.